get into God's Word. Open up Ecclesiastes chapter 8. We're going to do the entire chapter, and I'm going to start off by reading that chapter with you. Ecclesiastes chapter 8. And again, man, this book uh, takes a lot of work to really ponder and think and delve into. And even as we go through it, the first reading, some of you are going to go, what does he mean by that? <laughs> you know, where is he headed with that? But the Lord has some really, really encouraging things for us. So let's jump into it now, beginning in chapter 8, verse 1. Who is like the wise? And who knows the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom makes his face shine. And the hardness of his face is changed. I say keep the king's command because of God's oath to him. Be not hasty to go from his presence. Do not take your stand uh, in an evil cause for he does whatever he pleases. For the word of the king is supreme. And who may say to him, what are you doing? Whatever keeps a command, whoever keeps a command will know no evil thing and the wise heart will know the proper time and the just way. For there is a time and a way for everything, although man's troubles lie heavy on him. For he does not know what is to be, for who can tell him how it will be? No man has power to retain the spirit or power over the day of death. There is no discharge from war, nor will wickedness deliver those who are given to it. All this I observe while applying my heart to all that is done under the sun when man had power over man to his hurt. Then I saw the wicked buried. They used to go in and out of the holy place and were praised in the city where they had done such things. This also is vanity because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily. The heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. Though a sinner does evil a hundred times and prolongs his life, yet I know that it will be well with those who fear God, because they fear before him. But it will not be well with the wicked, neither will he prolong his days like a shadow, because, because he does not fear before God. There is a vanity that takes place on earth, that there are righteous people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked, and there are wicked people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. I said this is also vanity. And I commend joy. For man has no good thing under the sun but to eat and drink and be joyful. For this will go with him in his toil. Through the days of his life that God has given him under the sun. When I applied my heart to know wisdom and to see the business that is done on earth. How neither day nor night do eyes see sleep? Then I saw all the work of God, that man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. However much a man may toil in seeking, he will not find it out. Even though a wise man claims to know, he cannot find it out. May God bless the reading of his word. The title today is Submission in a Broken World. And I don't know about you, but when I read chapter 8, I think of many perplexing things and there's this call right that you hear of I can't figure it out no matter how much I want to figure something out I cannot figure it out and that's kind of how he ends the entire chapter and even throughout wait a second there's perplexities with authorities and there's perplexities that things that should happen to evil people don't and things that should happen to good righteous people do the opposite, right? And so there's all of these things. And so I just wanted to move this into our day and age and go, what are some perplexities that many of you are facing? What are some perplexities that you are frustrated by? What are some things that are annoying you, agitating your heart and soul like they are agitating mine? And I think of this. These are very recent things that have happened and many of you have even worked and some of this, some of you are border patrol, some of you have worked in some of these holding stations, you know these children, you've met them, you provided education, you provided support. And there's just something that feels so wrong, right, about five-year-olds and seven-year-olds and nine-year-olds that are not 
in a place that is safe and with their family and, and what is going on? This is, this is crazy, this is perplexing. This feels so wrong. And so we can get that sense of perplexity by looking at something like that, it's very close to home. You can also get it from just looking at authority structures that, that we see. So we hear about Ukraine, but you know, when, if you look into the life of, of Putin, um, my brother-in-law is a missionary in Latvia, and so he knows him very well. They have very, uh, very clear opinions about him and his, and his leadership. But then you begin to see like, man, there's, a, there's been many leaders throughout history Many leaders that have done horrible things. Uh, we, we think the number of communist regimes in the last 100 years is about 100 to 110 million people who died under communist regimes. And you're like, wait a second, I like authorities. And some of you might not even like the authority in your own city or your state or your nation. But what do we do, right? These things bring a lot of perplexity to us. And I think this has been very difficult for people too because this one just is so logical. I don't know about you, but when I see people that have four or five PhDs are at the supreme levels of education, much smarter than Chago curling, and they say, what is a woman? Or can a man have a baby? And they go, it depends. And you're just like, what? That, that just feels perplexing to me. Um, and it, it makes me feel unsettled. Wait a second, you're a learned person. You, you are an expert. You're gonna be someone that we have to rely on to, to navigate the course of life. And you can't even figure out some of the most simple things, right? A man and a woman and all of these things, guys, bring agitation to us. They, they make us feel unsettled. And these are the perplexities of life. And I feel like that is what the preacher is addressing in chapter 8. Then I saw all the work of God, that man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. There are just things that are too hard at times for us to figure out. However much man may toil in seeking, he will not find it out. Even though a wise man claims to know, he cannot find it out. This is the way the chapter ends, that there are these perplexities. There are these perplexities. And I think what I want to help us with is to understand what happens in the midst of all these perplexities or these enigmas or whatever, these confusions. I want to talk about that through motion sickness. Um, I'll, I'll give you a very personal story. I was a, a young man, for, uh, newly married to my lovely wife. We went up to see her family in Michigan and was going to, let's go with the boys event. And so they, they drug me up, uh, they didn't drug me up, they dragged me out of bed at five in the morning, <laughs> one of the boys. Um, they dragged me out of bed early, um, took me to a boat on Lake Michigan, and it was a brutally cold day. Like just driving out to the boat, I was like, oh my goodness. It was windy and cold, and I, I, they throw me on the boat, and we're all there, and we're going to go... Um, rigging for fish it's another story but we're gonna go fishing and I'm so cold that I, I, I put this hoodie on and I sit and I'm I thought it was cold and then they started the boat and went I got worse and we're just freezing to death on this thing and I'm looking down and I'm starting to get super super sick I can't believe how sick I feel and I'm starting to feel like a real like you know, pansy on the boat, all the men are fine and ho, 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 and drinking their coffee. And I'm literally feeling like I'm going to die. And I hurl over the boat. I kind of felt like Jonah for just a second. I'm like, okay, this is what it feels like. So I'm super sick. And so the captain grabs me by the shoulder and he says, young man, just stare out there. And I'm like, where? He goes, just stare at the sun that's rising. Just take a look at that. Look over there. He goes, it'll make you feel better. And what happens in motion sickness, and that is actually a technique, and even in, in a car, when somebody's feeling sick, you tell them to look at the horizon, and there's a reason for that. What happens in motion sickness is that the brain is getting conflicting information. And so what happens is there are things that you might be doing that make you feel like you're really at rest. You're seated. You might be looking at a book. You might be reading your phone. But your body keeps having sensations of being in movement. And so there's a bump, 
There's all these things that are happening. And so your body is saying, I'm at rest. Your brain's telling your body it's at rest, but your body is feeling like it's in motion. And these things have this big thing that happens and it's a brain scramble basically that happens and this is why you're feeling sick there's no virus in you there's no illness you're feeling super sick because your brain has a scramble going on and I remember this look at the horizon tell your brain the factual information that you are moving Get your brain and your body together. Look at the, you're moving. Things are moving. Like if you can kind of learn to get into that thing, it can really alleviate and help. Most of you are just going to take drugs. Go for it. All right. These perplexities, right, the perplexity of motion and that lead me to have a sickness. I want you to know that many of you are probably feeling circumstantial sickness in your life. If I said to you, is there moments where you just feel out of sorts? Are there moments in life where you just, things don't make any sense. And so what's in my brain is there are things that I know to be true. Like men can't have babies, right? You know, like this is true. But the world is, keeps giving me information and the world is doing this and it just, what happens is there are things that are taking place that are making your brain feel a little scrambled. And because of that, it can throw you off. And I would say to the point that it makes you even feel a little sick. So instead of motion sickness, I call this circumstantial sickness. There are, th th life shows up and does things that you think should be happening, but they're not, and it just throws us off kilter. This chapter has special help for us. And he gives us this help by telling us that he can give us wisdom to help us through it. That there is truth from God's word that you can know, that, that you can rely on, that will help alleviate this sense of, of being off kilter. And this is what he gives us, this idea of wisdom. To know what to do when there is no rule book. What do I do when, when there isn't a rule book for some of these things? How do I respond? And he tells us here that wisdom, and this is the part that really is exciting for me, is an opportunity to be a light. That you knowing how to traverse through life in places that are perplexing for other people will give you a wonderful opportunity to be a light. And could you look down at verse two with me? Because I think it's, to me, it's, it's the thing that's driving so much of what I'm excited to teach you is, I'm sorry, verse one, at the, the second part of verse one, a man's wisdom makes his face shine and the hardness of his face is changed. See, wisdom can soften our hard face. And I think this is what many of you and me included are experiencing. You start to just get this hard face of that doesn't make sense. This authority shouldn't be someone that is, is in that position, having that say. And these perplexities and these issues of life are causing you to have a stern face. And you need a light face. This is, you need a light face. You need to go through very hard things. You need to go through things that don't make sense. And people go, why is your face so bright? Why are you bearing these things this way? Because this is what God has for us. And I just want you to know that there are moments that I have had a very stern face. And, and, and I'm just perplexed by so much and so bothered by so much that I just can't make sense of it all, and God has wisdom for us today. So wisdom for the things that are out of our control, and he's gonna teach us that we need to have submission to God, and we need to have submission in these ways, an ordination of all things. God is the one that has established these authorities, and he gives us counsel on how to manage that. That he has sovereign providence over all things, even the injustices of life. The things where, where evil is getting away with it, he's like, I'm sovereign over that and I have an answer for you. And then he gives us his wonderful resource and that I want you to embrace. I want you to leave today embracing the resource 
to enjoy life. That you can enjoy life in the midst of all of these perplexities. That Christians can sit down and have a great meal with good friends and almost just laugh, right, together at the goodness of God in the midst of these hard things. So I want to go walk through this chapter with you and I hope that it will be a help to you. Wisdom knows how to handle authorities. And that's what you see from verses two to verse uh, seven. And so this is what he kind of tells us. Look at verse two with me. It says, it is um, verse two, I say keep the king's command because of God's oath to him. Keep the king's command. So now we're, he's gonna talk about authorities and he's gonna tell us how to walk through life with them. God is at work in all authority structures. All authority is placed there by God for his glory. And that's what we believe as Christians. There is not one ruler, one person that is anywhere from Hitler to Mao to Biden to Trump to Reagan to, I don't know, the Alamo's mayor. Okay. <laughs> to the mayor of Alamo, who was a lady who recently won and shook up our area? Yes, that lady. So everybody, God takes ownership for the people who are in authority. Good, bad, and evil, God says, I've established these people. But how are we to live under them? How, how are we to wisely deal with the authorities that we've been placed under? And wisdom knows how to handle these authorities. And so it's very clarifying here. And this is very important because if you, if you don't get this part clear, then it gets a little bit off. The main issue is what to do when we are not under control. That's the main issue. The main issue is what do we do when we are not in control? The preacher is not necessarily addressing whether the king is evil or good in his commands. All right? I am not, I've already preached on it before. I'm not going to go throughout the scriptures, we're not allowed to disobey God, right? We're not allowed for an authority structure in our life to tell us to, to, to do something against God's will. That's, that's another wrestling match. We're just talking, there's authority structures in our life. How are we supposed to handle them? How do we walk with wisdom through them? How do we honorably respond to these authorities? How do we honorably respond? So wisdom knows how to do that. And in verse 3, he says, always show respect. Always show respect. And he tells them in verse 3, whoever keeps a command will know how, will, will know no evil thing, and the wise man will know the proper time and the just way. I think I missed something. I'm so sorry. Verse 3, I, I did not read verse 3. <laughs> Be not hasty to go from his presence. Do not take your stand in an evil cause, for he does whatever he pleases. Do not be hasty. All that means in a Hebrew thing is do not, you, something happens that you don't like from authority, do not be disrespectful. To just walk away from his presence is to be disrespectful. Be honorable to authority. Be respectful to authority. He tells them, the sense is that you're gonna leave and maybe there's other people that don't like what authority is doing and you're gonna go connive or collaborate together. And he goes, don't resort to do something evil. Don't walk out of, in a disrespectful way from authority and then resort in an evil way to go do something. You cannot do that. Why? There is a price to pay for, for handling authorities that way. I mean, in verse four, this is the one I, I just read. He says, for the word of the king is supreme and who may say to him, what are you doing? Like, be, live in reality. Now, and I think we get really confused as Americans because we have representative government. It's, it's a good system, right? When you lay all the different political systems throughout history, I'll take ours, okay? I like our system. But, but most of all of history has been one of absolute rule and authority. There is a king that can say, off with your head. So he's saying, wake up and realize that these authorities can have great control in your life. They can ruin your life. Who can say to them, what are you doing? And I crossed it out, nobody can. So be very cautious on how you deal with authorities. 
Wisdom knows how to handle them. You need to have wisdom in the ones that even perplex you and that you don't like. And so he goes on in verse five. He's really encouraging us in honoring authority. He says there in verse five, whoever keeps a command will know no evil thing and the wise heart will know the proper time and the just way. Guys, when we do and honor authority, then we're not going to have to deal with a bunch of negative consequences. And so be cautious about that. It goes well for you when you honor authority. And one of the things is that you begin to realize a wise person demonstrates the proper time or the right response. What, what is the right way to, to manage a, a, an unjust authority figure? Are there ways to do that? Walk through that. Look into that. In Psalms 57, 4, David said, my soul is among the lions. And I like what Spurgeon said in comment, commenting about that verse. If your soul is among the lions, it is wise not to pull his whiskers. If your soul is really with lions, like, be cautious. It's the same thing here. We want to be cautious. We want to be wise. And I know that, that, that there are a lot of things that are perplexing, right? I think of, 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 of whether there's missionaries in Ghana or you hear of, uh, I think somebody texted me the other day, like, pray for, my, pray, pray for Columbia. They just put a new person in power and he, he's not a good man. He doesn't follow the Lord, right? Like, they have to have wisdom on how do we combat that? How do we appropriately go through that? So wisdom knows how to handle authorities. And let's just be honest, some of us are struggling with that, right? Maybe your property taxes have gone way up or they're, they're taking more money from your check every month. Well, the way to handle that is not to do something illegal. You and 10 of your buddies get together for a breakfast and say, this is how we push back. We ain't paying, <laughs> all right? You, there's consequences to, 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 for that, okay? But there's other means, better wise ways to deal with that. And so takeaway number one here, in wisdom, honorably deal with authorities. In the, what's gonna give you stability is like, let me be honorable, let me be respectful. It actually will make your face shine. It will make your face shine because other people are experiencing injustice. Other people are experiencing these destabilizing things and your face will shine in that moment when we know in wisdom how to deal with that. Wisdom knows how to thing, handle things out of your control. And this is where he goes in verse, the next six and seven. There are things we cannot manage. Like if you think authorities cause you to be feeling perplexed and destabilized, psh, he goes, authorities make you feel that way? There are a lot of other things that are out of your control. And now this is for all my control freaks out there. I'm preaching to you. No, no. But I'm gonna manage every little thing. I'm gonna have, I'm gonna make every outcome come out the way I want. There are so many things. And he begins to tell us that. And then he gives us in verse eight, Three examples of things that are completely out of your control that you could never manage. And he says, you cannot control the wind. He says there, he says, it, he calls it a spirit, but it's, it's wind in verse eight. No man has power to retain the spirit. No man has power over the day of death. You cannot control death. And you cannot control conflicts. If your country ends up in war, you might have had a say or I don't want that or, you know, but there are things that happen out of your control. You think that the Ukraine people feel like they had control? It, it was out of their hands. Before they knew it, there was a war. It came to them. And so there are many things that are out of our control. And you can feel this motion sickness of life because it's all coming and I don't know what to do. There's a lot of things out of our control. So how am I supposed to walk with wisdom through all of these things that I cannot manage, that I cannot handle? What do I do? Wisdom knows how to handle things that are out of your control. There's a wisdom that God can give you to know how to traverse through these things. 
And one of the things here, go to verse 9, is that wisdom allows us to know the real threats. See, what is the thing on the horizon that you and I need to look at so that we get stabilized? And verse 9 begins to lead us in that direction. All this I observe while applying my heart to all that is done under the sun when man had power over man to his hurt. So I've observed these things. I've looked ahead. I'm trying to figure it out. And one of the things is do not fixate on things you cannot control. Do not fixate on things that you cannot control. If you, try to, if you try to fixate on them and think that, okay, I'm gonna figure this out, I'm gonna, I'm gonna eat right and elongate my, like, there's things that you can't control. There are things that are, that are out of that, uh, they're not meant to be that. Because if you do, it will harden your face. Wisdom will give us eyes to see. So either I'm gonna have a hard face or I'm gonna have wisdom to see and that's what he tells us in verse nine. So the takeaway in this section is trust God in all circumstances. Their war shows up, death shows up, cancer diagnosis shows up. I can't control these things. What am I supposed to do? You need to trust God. You need to trust God. You can't trust yourself and you can't trust your ingenuity. Trust God. It will brighten your face. And I wanted to really slow down and go through some of this because wisdom knows how to handle injustice. Wisdom will know how to handle injustice. And this begins in verses 10 through 13. In chapter, in chapter we've seen this in multiple chapters, but in, in the other chapters, it's brought this up. Here, he actually gives us some very details about it. And he says, and he gives us an example. Then I saw the wicked buried. They used to go in and out of the holy place and were praised. Is that not weird? I saw the wicked buried. They used to go in and out of the holy place and were praised. Think about that. So this wicked man is getting buried. He was an evil person, but he played church and he's getting praised. Maybe you've seen that before. Maybe you've gone to a funeral. One of the things I've told you about funerals is, is people will pontificate at times, even when they don't know a good thing to say, they'll just make it up, all right? Because no one's going to give you a, a dose of harsh reality of what that person was like at a funeral. We all try to conjure something nice to say, and I think we've all experienced that. Wicked people seem to get honor at times. This guy was not a good guy. This person was a person that actually deserved great retribution, but he even gets honor. What do we do with that? It doesn't seem right that the wicked are getting honored, that, the, that they are the ones getting celebrated. And so he gives us this example that he saw in verse 10. And then he says in verse 11, because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily, the heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. What is he saying there? Delayed justice may seem as no justice. So this dude evil life, getting praised, he played a game, he fooled people, he gets honored, what does that lead to? It makes people, and we know this, that there's a famous, you know, delayed justice is no justice, that's a famous saying in, in law, but it, it's only, for the Christian, it only seems like no justice. Delayed justice only seems, for us Christians, as there is no justice, right? We know that the world interprets delayed justice and what it does is that in, it emboldens lawlessness. When people aren't getting punished for what they should be punished for, it will lead to more lawlessness, period. I mean, we, we don't have the snatch and grab stuff that's happening in New York City and San Francisco and LA where people are allowed to go into stores and like 10 people will snatch a bunch of stuff and get out. And I can't remember the detail. Somebody can. I think you have to steal over $500 worth of things before you get a thousand. Thank you, Tom. So what is that, what is that doing? It is emboldening criminals. <laughs> I mean, stores are being shut down left and right in these cities. What is it? What has happened is because there is no seeming justice going on, it's leading to more injustice. And this is what happens here on earth, right? We see that delayed justice may seem as no justice. 
And one of the ugly responses to that is that it leads to lawlessness because people are fooled that I'm getting away with it. But not in God's economy. He tries to encourage us that that might perplex you, it might throw you off, it might make you feel super insecure. Why do the evil rage? Why do people get away with it? God's justice is right on time. And that's what he's gonna tell us. Go down to verse 12 of this. Though sinners, though, though a sinner does evil a hundred times and prolongs his life, yet I know that it will be with, well with those who fear God because they fear before him, but it will not be well with the wicked. Neither will he prolong his days like a shadow because he does not fear before the Lord. And so he gives a contrast here. Who really is really living life? Who's really, really living this life? Is it the unjust person who's trying to prolong his days with evil? Or is it the person who is fearing the Lord? And he says the people who are really, really living life are those that fear God. They are the ones really living life. The people who think they're getting away with evil? No, no, no. You don't understand. Verse 13 says that justice is coming right on time. Perfectly on time, God will exact his justice. And so I'm, per I'm perplexed. I I I'm with you. This is not right. People getting away with things. They're getting celebrated. This is wrong. It's hardening my face because I'm so upset with it. And I'm telling you, you shouldn't harden your face. You should be able to look at the horizon, get a stabilizing thing into your life, not look so sickly, because you know that justice is happening right on time. Amen. That every evil will be dealt with. Every tear, Jesus says, he will collect of ours. That's what he promises. And so do not be perplexed. So takeaway three is trust in God's timely justice. Some of you have been treated in an unjust way. Maybe one of the injustices in your life is that someone has marred your name. Maybe someone has spoken evil of you and championed that and harmed your reputation. And I've helped many people with this. They've come to me distraught what do I do they're spreading lies about me what do I do and I tell them you cannot chase down all 25 people that this gossiper has influence you can't do that you're gonna have to entrust yourself just like Jesus did to him who judges justly and let God handle that you live your life for him do not let your face get hard Allow God in his time to mete out the justice that he will faithfully do. I like this from Matthew Henry. Sinners hear and deceive themselves for though the sentence be not executed speedily, it will be executed the more severely at last. Vengeance comes slowly, but it comes surely. And wrath is in the meantime treasured up against the day of wrath. And that's exactly what the Bible teaches, that God's justice is right on time. Okay. I know it's been a little bit of a harsh sermon. Perplexities, bad authorities, horrible th things that are out of my control, evil getting away with it. This is, this is heavy stuff. I cannot believe where wisdom will take us next. Wisdom will tell us to enjoy life in the midst of all this confusion. In the midst of these perplexities and difficulties, we are giving, given a resource in these perplexities. And I can't believe what it is. I'm so happy for what it is. Again, verse 14, guys, is a very famous verse. Let me read it to you just to remind you of the heaviness there is a vanity that takes place on earth that there are righteous people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked and there are wicked people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. I said that this is also vanity. This is the way it is. Here under the sun, 
we are going to experience things like this all the time. This does not seem right. Yeah, it's a broken world. We live in a broken world. And sin is reigning and things are happening out and I cannot figure out. I cannot, okay? There's an unfairness to, to this whole thing that I cannot wrap my head around. Welcome to the club. So, as, as a pastor now, get angry, look for the day of justice, and just grit your teeth and bear it. I, that's not the solution. He tells us, seek joy with wisdom. I'm really loving the book of Ecclesiastes. Because it has been giving me a resource to enjoy every day. The other day I thought about this. And this is, you're gonna, when we get to the end of Ecclesiastes, you're going to enjoy this, these massive conclusions that he has for us. But one of them is, did you know that a lot of people, you know, they dream of retiring someday and they grind and they work and they forsake maybe time with their family and they, they, they sacrifice all of these things and they're like, man, maybe, just maybe, I'll be blessed and retire at 62. Well, life expectancy for a man is what, 73 or something like that? So you grinded and you gave everything up and you sacrificed everything for 11 year window. Congratulations. I mean, that whole plan, that whole scheme is a horrible way to live. I like God's plan a ton more. Enjoy every day. Enjoy every single day. We learned in an earlier chapter that it literally is a gift from God that you get to delight in things every day. Like literally it's a gift from God to be able to do that. So wisdom helps us to enjoy the gifts that God has given us in the midst of destabilizing circumstances. I'm really happy about this resource. That I can, guys, I know that some of you, you're, you political junkies, you're like, this is the worst thing I've ever bared in my life. No, it's not. He ain't Hitler or whatever, okay? There, this is a command for people, Israel, in Babylon. This is a command for oppressive kings. This is a, a command under the worst scenarios. Here's a gift to you. You get to enjoy life in the midst of that. And I'm super thankful for it. And really what he tells you in verse 16 is just stop trying to figure it all out. Stop trying to figure it all out. Seek joy with wisdom in the midst of this. So how can he call us to joy? It feels over the top. Sinful law, sinful ruler, sinners who continue to sin and we're supposed to be joyful? This is, this is what the remedy is. This is the resource that I have. We're supposed to have joy in the midst of a crooked world that can't be straightened. Joy in the midst of backwards injustice. Joy not over what God has given, but what he has given. This is what we're called to do. And so we've learned this. I know it was mentioned multiple by other elders as well. Tap into something above the sun. Because the preacher has said that if he views everything under the sun, it's all vanity right if I'm going to use wealth or prominence or power or significance to make me have a sense of well-being in life he goes emptiness vain it's like trying to capture smoke you can't do it tap into something above the sun and I'm telling you one of the greatest gifts that God has given us I call it it's an old word buoyant this buoyancy it's like you're a little cork on a ocean that's going crazy you have buoyant faith unsinkable faith right what should be clear is that biblical joy is not bound in our circumstances and we know this from many other things Jesus even for the joy that was set before him endured the cross whoa 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 joy cross how do those two things mix they can in Christ they can come together and God knows that the, the, the sweet moments of life, and there are many, aren't they, will keep us balanced. 
will remind us that not all is lost. I'm sitting with my family, having a meal. I'm with my friends right now, living in a perplexing world and delighting in your company. Not all is lost. God is still up to something good. God is still the giver of this gift. And if you can see light today, embrace it, savor it, celebrate it, and use it in your fight for sustained God-conscious joy. This is how I think God gets us through the perplexities. And so the takeaway here is enjoy life in the midst of unstable circumstances. That literally is a resource that you and I have been given. And so in closing, in closing, I'm gonna, I'm gonna challenge some of you. Perplexities in life have been coming your way and you're getting a hard face. The unknown at work, the unknown with your health, the un, all of these things. And I'm not saying that life is not hard and that there are not moments where there's a time to grieve, right? And a time for that. But the call for the Christian is that we are called to have a bright face. That, that wisdom for the Christian can make his face shine. Your face can shine in the midst of all of this hard, of all these hard things. The perfect person, which is Christ, had perfect wisdom. Jesus had this wisdom of traversing through perplexities and hardships and difficulties, so much so that what happened in his life is what? He had a bright countenance. He had a bright countenance. He had a, an attractive a quality to him. He was a light in his place and in his world. He had a bright witness. His testimony was true. He was truly a bright light. So my challenge to you as we close is just that. Um, some of you have very hard faces. And for some of you, the burden can be a bad authority in your life. It could be your boss. Uh, you could be upset with our country. You could be upset with rulers from everywhere. The great reset. The rich authority people there. I don't know. But you're thinking about that and you're perplexed by that all the time. And when I look at you, you have a hard face. For some of you, it could be circumstances that are out of your control. You, you can't control the day of death. You, you can't control war that shows up. Right? These are out of your control. And so some of the things that are out of control in your life are bearing down heavy on you. Something at work, it's out of my control. And your face is hard. Maybe some have experienced injustice. A great evil has happened to you. And they're getting away with it. That person's getting away with it. They've marred my name. Some of you maybe have a history of sexual abuse. They're getting away with it. How do you handle these things that it, it left to themselves and you trying to figure it out and you trying to work through it is going to make you have the hard face, the beaten down. God in his kindness can make you walk through these things with a bright face. You can have a grave injustice done to you and you can sit down with your friends and have a delightful afternoon. How, how, how is that happening? Why is that there? Because it's afforded to you because you don't have to have the destabilizing thing of there's a disconnect between my brain and my body and I'm feeling motion sickness. There's a disconnect with all the circumstances around me and what I'm experiencing. No, you can look at the horizon and go, this is true. This is real. There is a God who is over all these authorities. There is a God 
who is never out of control. There's not one circumstance slipping through his fingers right now at any moment, at any time. I love to, somebody calls me with a disaster, I love to tell them it was no surprise to God. I lost my job. It wasn't a surprise to God. I love you, let's pray. God, you know this job was gonna be taken away. I love telling that to people. Because it's the only stabilizing thing in their life that it wasn't a surprise to God. This is the resource that you and I have. And I honestly think, I'm just sitting here going, are you kidding me, God? You're gonna give me a God who's over all authority. You're gonna give me a God who knows all circumstances. You're gonna give me a God who's gonna make every evil thing be taken care of one day. That's enough resource, God. Thank you so much, I can get through life. Oh, no, 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 I wanna brighten your face. How are you gonna do that? Oh, you're gonna enjoy life. <laughs> you're gonna have people mar your name and treat you bad and experience hardship, and there'll be a moment of grief, and then a week later, you'll have more joy in the dinner with your family than you deserve. And so my resource is not just that I'm doing and controlling and managing all of this. You're gonna get joy right now, every day. And people are gonna look at you and go, what's up with your bright face? I got a savior who loves me and died for me and is in control of all things and will right every wrong and I trust him. I trust him. So dear church, brighten up. Brighten up. Get a countenance that reflects the beauty of our Savior. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you, God, for the resources that you have given us. Lord, we need to just dwell, God, in the truth. And the truth is that you know all things, that you are trustworthy, that we can rest in you, that we can rely on you. And God, you even go abundant and beyond that and say, hey, I'm gonna give you joy. I'm gonna give you joy in all of these things. And so Lord, I want us to be people that live in delight, people that connect all of these amazing gifts to the gift giver. And I just want the world to come up to us all the time and go, why are you so content? Why does your face shine? Why do you go through the perplexities of life? Why do you have this buoyancy to you? Because we have a great savior. We have a great savior. And so God, I just thank you for these resources today. And may we just surrender our lives to you and let you use us for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son.